Мы двигаемся дальше по программе. У нас чуть-чуть изменился порядок выступлений. Профессор Калле из-за задержки рейса находится на пути из аэропорта. Поэтому мы сейчас попросим господина Леклерка выступить с той лекцией, которая должна быть несколько позже. А дальше мы двинемся как раз по программе. Так что я думаю, что не менее выдающиеся выступления мы сейчас услышим. Well, so I'm sorry for you because you have to listen to me a second time very quickly. But Jean-Philippe Collet has a flight delay, uh, about two or three hours, I don't know. So I hope he will be there after. If not, uh, I will have to make his talk. It will be a little bit difficult. So uh, I have to discuss with you within the next 30 minutes uh, the treatment of arrhythmia, where we are, and where do we go? And to be honest with you, when I finished to prepare my first talk, the duration of the talk was two hours. So I have to shorten my presentation to be, uh, to be on time. Because there is a lot of things in uh, the treatment of uh, arrhythmia. So I will discuss I will try to make an overview about different technology, about devices, about atrial fibrillation, about the problem of VTVF and sort of cardiac death. I will show you some example of uh, artificial intelligence in the electrophysiology and to give you just uh, some perspective about uh, what we can call genetic treatment. First about the device. Today, we have uh, in our devices very mature and smart algorithm to detect and to treat arrhythmia, to follow also the potential dysfunction of the device, especially the problem with the uh, ICD leads. Our uh, device can give you some very important information about the hemodynamic status of your patient, especially patient implanted uh, uh, with CRT. And sometimes you can prevent some outfellow decompensation with this new algorithm, and this is very useful because you can avoid outfellow hospitalization in your patients. We know now from many, many years that uh, remote monitoring with the devices is very safe and very efficient. So, we have already very good devices. I discussed a little bit about uh, leadless pacemaker and one of the questions from, uh, from the floor. What, uh, what to do if you want to uh, make a DDD pacemakers? So far, there is two technology on, uh, on development. The first one is uh, uh, to implant uh, one VVI pacemaker here, but also to implant another one in the atrium and to give them the possibility to connect. It's a little bit more difficult to implant a uh, leadless pacemaker in, uh, at the, uh, in the right atrium because the wall of the atrium is very, very thin. And it's a little bit more difficult. There is some protocol ongoing. There is also another very interesting feature which is already uh, tested, which is you use only a VVI pacemaker, so just a pacemaker in the right ventricle, but with this pacemaker, you can have an idea of the activity of the atrium. How does it work? With uh, the sensor uh, implemented in the, in the pacemaker, you can have different activity, and this activity are directly correlated to the heart sound. And so you can have A1, A2, A4, and A4, and if you consider A4, A4, is uh, the time of the atrial systole. So your pacemaker in the, right, in the right ventricle may know when is the atrial, atrial systole. So when he can detect the A4, at this time he will give a short AV delay to make a good synchronization 
between electrical activity and ventricular activity. And it works. Here, you have the patient with heavy block, and you have the rate of heavy synchronous pacing. That means that the right ventricular spacing is synchronous with the electrical activity of the, of the atria. With a VVI pacemaker, it's only in 40% of the cases. With this new algorithm, you go up to 80%. So with a single pacemaker in the ventricle, in 80% of the case, you can provide AV synchrony just by detecting the electrical activity in, uh, in the atrium. The only problem today with this technology is that it works very well when the heart rate is slow. But as soon as your patient is exercising, the heart rate is increasing, and the efficiency of the algorithm is a little bit tricky. But by the way, I'm sure that this will be better in the future. We discussed about uh, leadless pacemaker, and this is the first case uh, we presented uh, in the European Heart Journal, showing that it was the first leadless CRT patient, because this patient had a micro here, and he has also this device I presented many a uh, few minutes ago, as a Y system with the battery, the transmitter, and this. And this patient had the CRT without any lead. And I think this could be the future of the patient. The advantage of that, this technology is that you pass in the endocardium and not in the epicardium. And this is just to show you the difference in terms of uh, cure duration with uh, VVI and by V pacing. You know subcut uh, subcutaneous ICD. You know that the problem with uh, ICD is the lead, especially in young patients. Now we have very secure CAN, but we still have some problem with the lead. And one uh, of the risk of the ICD, ICD lead is the risk of fracture. And when there is a fracture of the lead, the lead sends some information to the box telling that the patient is at 400, 500 BPM. And so it gives shocks. It's inappropriate shock due to lead fractures. And you are, your patient is very fine. And one of our patients had a lead fracture two weeks ago, and he received 25 shocks. Inappropriate. He was like you and me. There, very comfortable, and he received 25 shocks because the information received by the, the defibrillator were wrong because there was a lead fracture. So now we have a new technology, which is a subcutaneous, uh, devices, so you have a can, and then you have a lid just inserted under the skin. And so with this technology, you have less risk of fracture. The only problem of this technology today is that you cannot pace the, the heart. For example, if you want to do anti-tachycardia pacing to reduce VT, it's not possible. So the future now for this technology is to insert a leadless pacemaker and to make some communication between the ICD and the pacemaker and in case of VT, to provide anti-tachycardia pacing to reduce the VT. This is another example of uh, extravascular ICD, which is uh, under evaluation. As you can see on this slide, the lid is inserted under the sternum, not under the skin. The first generation was over the sternum and under the skin. This one is a little bit more complex because you insert a lid in behind the sternum. But the advantage of this technology as compared to the first one with the lid under the skin is that you will have lower defibrillation threshold so you can use smaller can, and with this technology, we will be able to pace the heart. So it will be really not in the vein, but under the sternum, and so you can pace the heart. This is under clinical evaluation. 
This is uh, what they call the string ICD. You have everything in this device. You have no can, nothing. It's probably the future. It's very easy to insert. You don't need fluoroscopy. You have just a, like a string, and you have everything inside. The battery, the defibrillation capabilities, and it's a rechargeable device. So probably in the future, we will not have can for this patient uh, with ICD. There is also, for pacemaker, a very new technology, and it's especially in Switzerland, they are working about devices without battery. The problem of the technology today is that your battery has an expectancy uh, life of about 10 years, but you have to change the battery every 10 years. With the system, you don't need a battery because you use the mechanical motion of the heart to provide energy with what they call energy harvesting mechanism. So when your heart is beating, a system is taking this energy and transforms this energy to electrical activity. So you don't need a battery. And this was uh, tested uh, two years ago already in animals. You have also solar pacemakers. This is very fashionable. It's for the ecology, is very good because you don't need lithium, which is very, very huge problem for pollution. So you have a, it's not in human use already, but you have a, a small device under the skin and they can take the light uh, and they can transform uh, the light uh, to electrical activity and thus to avoid to have a battery. You all know already this technology because it's very, very fashionable at this time uh, in uh, cardiac pacing. When you pay the right ventricle, you know that you can induce desynchrony in the left ventricle and to decrease the left ventricular ejection function. A new technology could be to pace the HIS, the HIS bundle. This was a technology which started 15 years ago, but there was some technical issue and problem of high pacing threshold. But today we have new tools to help us to pace exactly at the HIS bundle level and we have now good data about uh, the threshold of this uh, technology. So you'd need a special catheter to put your lead just on the e spacing. And this is an example of a patient with very narrow QRS. It's like a normal QRS, but here you can see a spike. So this patient is paced, but it's normal QRS duration. It's impossible to have this with right ventricular pacing. So it's just because you have a block at the east bundle and ju you just pace just after the block. And so you can capture the normal conduction system. This is just a comparison in a small study between east pacing and right ventricular pacing. And you can see that you have less complication, a better outcome with east pacing as compared to right ventricular pacing. But it's not only for conventional pacemaker indication. There is some groups, especially in China, who try to make ease pacing for patients with CRT indication, patients with left bundle branch block. And you have, for example, an example how it works. So you have here the left bundle, the right bundle, and you have a block there. And if you pace here with the high energy, you can activate, of course, the right bundle, the right ventricular uh, muscle, but also the left bundle. So in patients with proximal left bundle branch block, by pacing the ease, you can correct uh, and have very, very narrow QRS. And there is very promising data. It's, a, it's not randomized controlled trial, so we have to be very careful of that. But you can see that you have the follow-up data for left ventricular ejection fraction in uh, orange and the baseline. And for example, with this uh, patient for, with CRT indication and with e pacing, the left ventricular ejection fraction uh, increased from 32% to 60%, which is a very impressive result. Usually with CRT, it's about 8 to 10%. So it's very impressive. Perhaps too much, but very impressive. 
and also you have a huge decrease in left ventricular and systolic volume. The advantage of this technology is that you need only one ventricular lead and not two ventricular leads. You know that uh, our uh, patients now are more and more connected and uh, one of the problems of atrial fibrillation is to detect atrial fibrillation. In about 30 to 40 percent of the cases, atrial fibrillation is silent. You have no symptoms. The problem of this silent atrial fibrillation is that the uh, outcome is worse because patients are not treated. So you have a higher risk of stroke, higher risk of heart failure, and so on. So it's very important to detect atrial fibrillation. But to detect atrial fibrillation, so far you had to make an ECG, which is not very easy. And you have a lot of devices in patients, for example, with palpitation, or in patients with very high risk of atrial fibrillation, like patients uh, over 70%. So you have different technology. Here it's just uh, like an altar. Here it's uh, with your cell phone, you can have an, an app and you just put your finger and uh, you have automatically uh, strip ECG strips. Here you have a camera, so you put your finger there and it can tell you if you have a regularism or, or not. And you have also the alive core you can put behind your uh, cell phone and you put your, your fingers and you will have an a, a ECG and you can see that uh, the quality of the ECG is not so bad. I'm sure you heard the, pro the release of the Apple Watch. I don't know if you have an Apple Watch. So far I have a Switch Watch, which is a very nice watch. Give me the time, but I, I don't know if I am in atrial fibrillation or not. I don't know. But with the, especially with the Apple 4 and Apple 5, if you press on the button of the Apple Watch, you have a very nice ECG. So if you have palpitation, you just do that, and you have an ECG for 30 seconds. Also, you have some T-shirts. You can put a T-shirt, and they record your heart rhythm, and you know if you have atrial fibrillation, VT, or something like that. This is very useful, especially if you have, want to follow patients because it's difficult to put an alter system during two or, three, two or three days feasible, but for three weeks, but they can wear a t-shirt. And the t-shirt will continuously uh, uh, record the rhythm of your patients. Some words about AFib ablation. It was uh, one of the major advances uh, in the field of AP was AFib ablation. Before AFib ablation, we had only drugs. And mainly the best drugs was amiodarone, but you know that the efficacy of amiodarone at one year is about 60%, with a lot of side effects. And uh, from France, from uh, Bordeaux, they found that in the majority of the cases in patients with atrial fibrillation, the origin was pulmonary vein. So the treatment of atrial fibrillation is not to go inside the vein to destroy the site of this uh, pulmonary vein um, activity, but to isolate the vein. Because if you go into the vein, you have a risk of stenosis. And you have two technologies today to do so. You have a radio frequency, so you make a circle, usually around the two uh, left and right veins, point by point, so far. And so you isolate the pulmonary vein from the atrium. And, see, and if you still have active electrical activity or fibrillation in the pulmonary vein, this will not go to the atrium. And now you have a, a, another technology, which is a cryo uh, balloon. Instead of uh, eating the heart at 65 degrees, you frozen the heart at minus 80 with the balloon. And there was a comparison, and for paroxysmal ablation, uh, the two systems are working uh, very well. So this is just an example of uh, what we do. For example, here you can see that we, we, we perform the isolation of the right, uh, the two right uh, ventricular vein, and here is the isolation of the, on the left one. Here it's uh, just uh, using cryoablation. So you have the uh, electrical activity in uh, in the atrium here, and you have the this is the potential of the vein, and you can see that here, for example, you, don't, you cannot recover when you have the electrical activity. You have no more uh, 
pulmonary vein potential, so that means that your vein is totally isolated from the atrium. So there is a lot of uh, progress in FE ablation. I don't want to go in details in everything. But now we have other uh, technology, especially in imaging technology and EP technology, uh, to find what we can call rotors. It's, uh, you will see one example. Uh, at the level of the atrium, there is some uh, source of uh, very uh, heterogeneous activity with like uh, rotors. You have also what we call non-pulmonary vertebral ablations. Now also we do uh, what we call voltage map guided ablations. So when your catheter, you can uh, uh, assess uh, the voltage of, of, dif of different zone. And when it's a zone of low voltage, that means fibrosis, and you can uh, try to isolate this zone. Also now there is some interesting uh, data showing that when you do a, a FEB ablation, probably also you have to uh, isolate the left lateral appendage. And we have a lot of new devices. I will show you an example. Al also, we have a lot of new energy source and uh, what we can call a very, with high power uh, sources and very short duration of, um, of application. Just to, to show you some uh, uh, example, for example, like uh, here, yeah, like uh, you have a rotors and uh, in some patients, especially in patients with a, a persistent of permanent ablation, it could be very useful uh, uh, to uh, ablate these uh, different zones. This is just to show you that uh, when you, the patient has a non-pulmonary vein source of, um, of, the, of the atrial fibrillation, uh, you have a, a, a worse outcome in terms of recurrence. So just to show you that, so for example, you have some uh, zone like uh, this uh, area uh, in the red, we will show you that you have a zone of fibrosis, and if you isolate this zone of fibrosis, you can improve not the risk of recurrence of atrial fibrillation, but the risk of occurrence of new atrial tachycardia. And this is just of a meta-analysis showing that when you do FEB ablation, probably you have to consider also to uh, do uh, ablation of the left atrial appendage because this can uh, decrease significantly the risk of uh, recurrence of atrial fibrillations. So just to show you how the engineers are very, very smart, they can uh, invite you a technology using laser, some technology uh, with uh, like this, uh, uh, you can think it's a movie about the space, but you can have a very high uh, radio frequency um, uh, technology. And this is also another one and uh, also this, uh, the advantage of this technology, as you can see here, is that you can ablate m very quickly a larger zone as compared to a conventional radio frequency. I just want to show you an example of artificial intelligence also in, uh, in atrial fibrillation, and this is a, a work from Dr. Sen from uh, Taiwan. We use uh, uh, imaging technique. He used data from CT, from the pulmonary vein, and the left atrium, and they did uh, deep learning, uh, everything what you want. And they tried to find a way to predict the success of left atrial, uh, left uh, uh, ablation, based just on imaging techniques. And uh, they did a, a work that they presented, but they can predict the success in 97%, just based on data from CT about the pulmonary vein and also uh, from the left atrium. What about VT ablation? For VT, we have drugs, we have ICD, but now we have a new technology, new techniques, which is VT ablation. And we have a dramatic increase in uh, VT ablation during the last 10 years. Why? Because now we have a very sophisticated imaging techniques, 3D mappings. I will show you an example of a VT. You can see exactly where you have to ablate the VT. We have a new technology, very uh, high level of uh, catheters, given uh, sometimes in one bit of uh, the activation of all the left ventricle. We have a specific algorithm because it's a lot of processing of imaging, and also we use always cardiac imaging, especially CT, 
and magnetic resonance imaging. And this is just the type of uh, image we can have. And even if you are not an electrophysiologist, you can understand what's happened. Oh, but it's only one shot, by the way. It's a picture of the left ventricle, and it was a patient with a uh, myocardial infarction. And when you look at the activation, you can see that the activation is going through this uh, small high isthmus. And then after the activation, go this way and this way and come back here. If you want to ablate the VT, it's not very complicated. You just have to put a line here with radio frequency. And so when you will have this activity, if you put your line here, the activity will stop. And you will have, you will have no more VT. And you can see that, it, and usually we try to uh, uh, identify this uh, zone of isthmus and just, you just have to make a line at this level. This is another example of a patient with a, a left bundle branch block VT with a, a superior axis and this patient had a previous surgery for the correction of a, a ventricular septal defect and here you can see uh, the correction of the ventricular septal defect in black and here it was a RV incision and uh, all this around was a lo uh, low voltage map showing that you have a very poor activity and probably a zone of fibrosis. And here you can see again the circuit of the VT going from here around the tricuspid annulus and the inferior wall and coming back through the small isthmus. And so for this patient it was we just did a line here, and this patient had no more VT. So you can see that it's a very uh, combination between imaging techniques, electrophysiology, and also understanding of the different circuits. The future for electrophysiology will be using magnetic resonance imaging. And uh, so far, it's, we have, uh, it's the beginning of this technology, but you can see that with uh, magnetic resonance imaging and specific tool, you can have a good uh, a freedom of moving of this catheter. They can move on this way and not the other one. Also, use, using stereotaxis, you can drive from outside of the room your catheter because you just have to exp give uh, with the stereotaxis the movement you, uh, that you want your catheter will have and it will do this automatically. And also we can know also that with when you use magnetic resonance imaging and specific devices, uh, you decrease the distension of the tissue and the force, and so you are more safe in, and more efficient uh, for ablation. And this is just an example of two lesions uh, using RMI and not RMI technology. There is also a very interesting paper, and this is a, a very, probably the future also, that they did ablation of VT from outside of the patient using radiotherapy, no catheter, from outside. You imagine, you put your patient in a radionuclide uh, radio machine, like a cyber knife or something like that, and you can uh, treat the patient without any catheter inside. What's about artificial intelligence? When you look in the literature, everybody is talking about artificial intelligence. I'm not sure that everybody is really knowing what is artificial intelligence. You can see deep learning, machine learning, network, etc. Blah, blah, blah. I just want to show you an example that was published this year. It was very interesting. It was a, a work trying to detect the value of the left ventricular ejection fraction without echocardiography, just based on the ECG. So you take the ECG and you can tell this patient has less than 30% of ejection fraction and this one has 40% or 50%, just based on the ECG. So it was uh, published by Dr. Atia in uh, Nature Medicine. So it's a conventional ECG as you can do every day in your daily practice. And so, they want to create a network to identify how they can detect from the ECG the patient with a low ejection fraction and just to perform echo only in this patient. You can see that they use a lot of patients. 
they started from uh, 600,000 patients and they use uh, 30,000 patients uh, to train the network, uh, 9,000 patients to validate the network, and they test their algorithm in 52,000 patients. So, huge cohort. So, it was, so they use uh, a lot of ECG, and so they have a system uh, uh, with uh, artificial intelligence. And look at this curve. It's very impressive. It's the area under the curve to detect the ejection fraction based on the ECG. It's 0 0.93. If you look at the mammography for breast cancer, it's only 0 0.85. Cervical cytology, 0 0.7. PSA for prostate cancer is 0 0.92. That means that this algorithm is almost doing as well as PSA for prostate cancer to detect LVF. We have also new technologies. It's just a paper published uh, two years ago about optigenetics, which is a, a new discipline that will allow you to target light-induced modulation of the function of excitable tissue through the expression of light-sensitive proteins like ion channel. It is just a new technology, but these have potential implication in EP for pacing CRT or defibrillation. Just to uh, uh, conclude about uh, genetics, you know that we have more and more uh, uh, genetics in our daily practice in EP, especially for a patient with what we call inherited uh, channelopathies, uh, for Brugada, long QT, and so on. And sometimes this patient has uh, some uh, genetic uh, variation. And now we have uh, some uh, a uh, new technology to repair the, the DNA, like the CRISPR-Cas9, but there is also a paper uh, talking about the correction of a pathogenic gene mutation in human embryos, showing that if you can detect a mutation in an embryo, probably in I don't know how many years, you will fix this and your newborn will not have the risk of sudden cardiac death related to long QT of the of um, or Brugada. So now uh, that Professor Collet is arriving, I can conclude. So I think that uh, for during the last two decades in electrophysiology and device, we moved far and very quickly. But I can tell you that now we are moving far away and faster. And the goal of this uh, improvement in EP is to provide to our patient a personalized treatment of their arrhythmia. Thank you very much. So, we, so now it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Collet. No, for the lecture there is no question. Огромное спасибо за ваш интересный доклад. Когда вижу такие впечатляющие результаты новых инноваций, ваших достижений, мне кажется, что я всю жизнь занимался разной ерундой. Но вопрос у меня такой. Всю жизнь меня мучает один вопрос. Если фибрилляция желудочков... Они останавливаются тут же. А если фибрилляция предсердия, они всю жизнь работают, работают. Вот, вот бывает ли такая ситуация, когда они устают, и э, наступает то, что там нет никакой электрической деятельности, и мы называем асистолия предсердий. И почему не останавливаются? Предсердия, желудочки тут же останавливаются. Спасибо. Yeah, it, it's true that uh, we, we have this uh, data from uh, uh, from uh, the memory of the device that uh, uh, we didn't know that, but in some patients, ventricular fibrillation can stop 
uh, after 15 or 20 or 30 seconds. And uh, this uh, was especially in patients with a non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. And uh, this is uh, because sometimes uh, you, when you have a circuit with a, a, v a VT, but also for f uh, ventricular fibrillation, you can have a, sp a spontaneous uh, uh, conduction block. We can explain that. It's one of the, of the explanation. And uh, so it was a very uh, surprise because we thought that the VF was always uh, very dangerous for the patient because it would not stop. But especially in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy in about 40%, when you have a start of the VF, after 30 seconds, it stop. But I, we don't have a clear explanation about that. Okay. Спасибо вам. Я э, понял то, что вы сказали про желудочки. Ну а почему не останавливаются предсердия? Почему они всю жизнь фибрилируют? И мучают нас всех. Спасибо. Atrial fibrillation can stop as well. Atrial fibrillation can stop as well. No? Sorry. <laughs> atrial systole? Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, you have atrial systole and this uh, starts again. I, I, I don't get your question, I miss it. Okay. <laughs> no, no. That, that, that depends on because, for example, sometimes you have a sinus, uh, uh, sinus arrest. It can be transient for, uh, because you have a stop uh, uh, in the sinus and this is start again. Uh, I don't know why atrial fibrillation can stop and why not asystole can stop as well. This, uh, this is uh, especially if you have a vagal, uh, vagal stimulation for that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, good uh, afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank the uh, uh, Russian Society of Cardiology for their kind invitation. So my name is uh, Jean-Philippe Collet, and uh, um, I'm from uh, uh, Paris. Um, and I'm working uh, in a very old hospital uh, which is called Pitié Salpêtrière. So um, my task is to uh, give you some uh, <coughs> thoughts about uh, uh, resuming uh, antithrombotic therapy uh, after major bleeds. And uh, as you know, um, all anticoagulation especially is a, a, a major concern because the vast majority of uh, patients uh, who are admitted uh, f uh, in hospital for side effects of treatments are mainly because uh, they are exposed to uh, oral anticoagulation or also uh, insulin therapy for diabetes. The, uh, these are the main factors uh, uh, responsible for these uh, unwanted uh, events. And you can see that uh, major bleeds uh, while exposed on oral anticoagulation um, is an issue uh, with a high rate of uh, mortality uh, and a high rate also of uh, uh, fatal bleeds. Uh, and it fran in France, um, we um, estimate that the number of uh, patients uh, who are dying uh, because exposed to uh, oral anticoagulation is about the same as those who are dying from a uh, um, um, car accident. Uh, so this is just to show you uh, how uh, important uh, it is. 
Uh, we have been uh, knowing for many years that uh, bleeds uh, are associated uh, with worse outcome, uh, especially uh, when occurring during uh, the uh, in-hospital stay. And you can see on this slide that uh, compared to a patient without bleeds, uh, in-hospital mortality uh, is almost uh, three to four times higher uh, when there is a major bleed. Um, and th these are quite uh, uh, new data because uh, uh, it was only published uh, in 2003 um, and the, the risk of bleeds uh, is a quite uh, recent finding. And uh, we have now more in-depth uh, data uh, showing that uh, bleeds uh, can be spontaneous but also bleeds uh, can be the results of interventions. Uh, and you can see that uh, whether it is uh, provoked uh, or not, uh, the result is quite the same uh, and it has a real impact uh, on uh, patient outcome. And you can see uh, these are uh, old data. Uh, at that time, um, we were using very aggressive uh, antithrombotic approach uh, with 2B3A um, and also uh, heparin for the entire hospital uh, stay, and this explains uh, why these bleeding rates are, are so high and uh, does not uh, fit uh, with our uh, contemporary practice nowadays. But anyway, this is just to, uh, to show you that uh, access site bleeds is a matter of concern. And uh, there is also an, another important uh, um, factor, which is uh, bleeding from uh, unknown cause uh, because uh, usually they are not fixed uh, and associated also with worse outcome. So you will know that uh, uh, knowing the uh, origin of the uh, bleeding uh, has uh, a real impact uh, on uh, survival. Now if we uh, look at the weight uh, of bleeds versus mark other infarction and also transfusion, uh, it is important uh, to uh, recognize that uh, the weight of uh, major bleeds on uh, survival is uh, as important as a recurrent MI after an acute coronary syndrome. And we did not expect that. Uh, and at that time, we collected this data. Uh, we were using very aggressive antithrombotic therapy uh, because we, uh, our thinking was that uh, bleeds could be fixed uh, and uh, did not have such an important impact on outcome. And more importantly, uh, on uh, <coughs> the, uh, this slide, you can see also the impact of blood transfusion. And uh, at the time we collected this data, uh, we thought that the transfusion uh, could be used very liberally uh, to uh, treat uh, the bleed. But in fact, uh, you can see that uh, when there is a transfusion, it is associated worse outcome. Not because of the importance of the bleeds, but also because uh, transfusion per se uh, uh, has uh, a detrimental impact, uh, mainly because it can reverse the effect of antithrombotic therapy, and it has also a thrombogenic uh, um, 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 impact on, 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 uh, on the patient and may lead uh, to more acute thrombotic events. Now if we move to uh, a more recent area, we have uh, more uh, in-depth data on bleeding on NOAX. Uh, these are the direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, they have been released on the market uh, quite recently uh, and uh, they are uh, being more and more used, uh, especially because their safety profile is much better. And uh, we have a few registry uh, showing um, bleeding on NOAX. And this is a, a French uh, registry uh, collecting all the bleeds uh, that have uh, occurred uh, while being exposed uh, on the NOAX uh, that are on the market. And it is interesting to see that uh, half of uh, these major bleeds are spontaneous and mainly uh, GI bleeds 
and uh, the other half are provoked, uh, highly related to trauma or multiple trauma or head trauma. And it is, uh, you, you will see that it is uh, important. The second point is that the vast majority of the patients, while bleeding on NOAX, uh, whether the, were in, in the, the target range of the uh, um, plasma concentration uh, of the uh, drug, which means that very few of these patients uh, were overdosed. Uh, and we usually have the idea that uh, when the patient bleeds uh, on VKA, it is because they were overdosed, but this is not always the truth, and I think that uh, this is uh, a, a, a direct uh, data showing that it is not the case. And uh, there have been uh, some concern with these uh, new uh, direct oral anticoagulants uh, because uh, of uh, the lack of antidote. So nowadays uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, antidotes uh, against the uh, direct thrombin inhibitor dabigatran, which is the Praxbind. And uh, we have also, it's not on the market, but the, the antidote uh, for the uh, direct antitene, uh, rivaroxaban and apixaban. And the question is whether having these drugs available on the market uh, has some clinical implication in terms of patient survival when they have a major bleeds. And on this uh, same uh, registry, uh, the patient outcome and managements uh, were also um, collected. And you can see that uh, overall the mortality of these uh, bleeds were 13.5%. And interestingly, you can see that uh, almost 8% of these patients had also major thromb thromboembolic events, mainly uh, related to uh, the use of uh, reversal agents, but also because the therapy was not resumed uh, after the uh, major bleed has occurred. And uh, this is an important question because uh, we never know whether we should uh, resume the therapy uh, after an intracranial bleed, for example. And you can see also uh, on, on, this, uh, on this slide that a uh, few patients had... Uh, some antidote injected uh, at the time of the major bleeds. And you can see that the outcome of the patients were not different as compared to those who had uh, no uh, antidote uh, injection while bleeding on no axe. So um, this is just uh, challenging uh, the uh, clinical utility of these uh, antidotes in the real life practice. And uh, the, 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 the market penetration of these new drugs uh, has been uh, questioned first because there were no antidotes. The antidotes uh, are now available and we are not quite sure whether they can improve the patient outcome. So this is uh, an issue. And finally, the last point, you can see that uh, when there is a, a major bleed, the mortality differs according to the type of bleeds. And uh, when the bleed uh, is intracranial, um, the pronostic is the worst. Uh, whereas uh, when you have a bleed where the origin uh, can be identified, and when there is an intervention uh, that uh, corrects the, the, uh, the, the bleeding location, then uh, the prognosis is uh, much better. Now, to answer the question whether we should um, uh, resume therapy after a major bleed, uh, especially in the setting of uh, uh, PCI, of course, but also in the setting of atrial fibrillation, where we have uh, older patients with more comorbidities and in whom we are more reluctant uh, to uh, uh, resume the therapy. So we have to re-stratify, and I think that we have now tools uh, which can be very helpful. The first one is uh, data which are derived from uh, uh, major trials on uh, coronary artery disease patients. And now we are able to know what is a low risk of ischemia, what is a high risk of ischemia, what is a low risk of bleeds, what is a high risk of bleeds when you have a CAD, 
what is a low risk of death and what is a high risk of death. And we have all, you know, the uh, independent predictors, you know, of this uh, major uh, outcome of interest. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when the patients are uh, exposed to uh, anticoagulation, uh, the thrombotic risk stratification is much more complex. Uh, and uh, you need to use uh, some uh, specific uh, tools because uh, in about one third, uh, these diseases are concomitant. So you have atherothrombosis and you have cardioembolic uh, stroke related to AF. And then uh, the uh, classification and the risk stratification is a bit more tricky and complex. Uh, and it has been uh, divided uh, in uh, five different categories. So you have uh, the low risk, uh, which is very uh, easy to understand. Uh, it's when you are far away from a PCI, far away from an acute coronary syndrome, or when you have a chads vas score which is uh, zero or one. And on the other hand, you have the very high risk on the top of this uh, uh, diagram where you have uh, the uh, recent ACS within the last seven days or when you have the patients with uh, mechanical valves or chats vasque, uh at six or more, which means that uh, these patients have already had uh, a stroke uh, while uh, or not on anticoagulant therapy. And finally, uh, patients uh, with LVADs. And in between, you have the high, moderate, and low to moderate category. And this is uh, our task uh, to uh, understand where we are. And this uh, is going to help the decision making on whether we should uh, continue the therapy or we should uh, withheld any uh, reintroduction after a major bleed. And finally, uh, you have uh, the bleeding risk stratification. And uh, this was published uh, in uh, 2017. And uh, this uh, position paper was dedicated to major bleeds occurring uh, on antithrombotic therapy and how to resume the drugs. So uh, the graph is a bit complicated, but uh, you're, you're going to understand uh, that uh, how uh, you have to proceed. So first, you have to identify the bleeding source and the severity. Then you have uh, to apprehend uh, the clinical setting. And finally, uh, you have to evaluate uh, the patient's clinical risk factor for bleeds. So it's a recurrent bleeds. So mainly to uh, assess uh, the risk of recurrent bleeds, you use the Hasblad score, uh, which uh, is very well known and which is, e which is uh, quite easy to use. Now uh, for the bleeding source and the severity, uh, it's uh, quite straightforward. So if you have an intracranial bleeds or life-threatening bleeds of extracranial location, but of unknown location, you are dealing with a very uh, high risk patients. If you have a major extracranial bleeds where the location has been identified, but uh, which uh, was not fixed and not treated uh, effectively because an intervention could not uh, be performed, uh, then you are dealing with a high risk patient. And finally, the moderate and the low to moderate risk are the patient in whom the location is known and in whom you have treated effectively uh, the bleeding location. For example, it's a GI bleeds, uh, which has been uh, treated by an intervention. Uh, this could be uh, also uh, uh, any other type of uh, uh, bleeding source that has been uh, treated with an intervention, like you know, an embolization or whatsoever. And you will see that uh, when you have uh, among uh, the uh, very high bleeding risk at least one of these factors, uh, then uh, you cannot resume therapy. For uh, the uh, moderate, low to moderate, and low bleeding risk, in the vast majority of the case, you will be able to resume the treatment, whatever it is, 
anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy because you know where is the bleeding and you know that the bleeding location has been fixed. And this is very important. Now, as I told you, uh, the most uh, difficult situation is intracranial bleeds. And uh, to be honest, uh, it's uh, usually uh, a very difficult situation because uh, there is no uh, recipe. And uh, probably you have to trust on brain imaging and on uh, the uh, expertise of uh, neurovascular uh, people, but sometimes uh, they do not know. And this is what was published in the 2017 uh, paper. So uh, if you have an intracranial hemorrhage in a patient uh, with an indication for oral anticoagulation, especially uh, me mechan mechanical heart valves, when you have a mechanical heart valve, especially in the mitral position, you, you cannot leave uh, without uh, oral anticoagulation. And if you go um, in um, neurosurgery departments, uh, you have many patients uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, admitted for intracranial bleeds, especially with uh, mechanical valve in the mitral position, and in, in whom uh, the oral anticoagulation has been uh, interrupted uh, for more than three weeks. But it is because, you know, there is the, f uh, the, um, the, uh, the risk of recurrent bleeds uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the risk of fatal events. So this is a tricky balance. But these are very, very few patients. So uh, you have also patients with uh, non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And when uh, there is a, a lower intracranial uh, uh, hemorrhage uh, with... Uh, multiple microbleeds, usually it's a contraindication to resume therapy. And then uh, you have other options uh, like uh, left uh, appendage uh, uh, closure uh, to uh, avoid resuming therapy. And you have also in-between situation where you have intracranial hemorrhage, then uh, you assess the risk uh, according to the CHATS-VASC risk of uh, embolization and you may consider uh, using NOAX instead of uh, antivitamin K, or you may consider also avoiding uh, oral anticoagulation because uh, of uh, the uh, high risk of recurrent intracranial hemorrhage. These are very few patients. Usually they are elderly patients with multiple comorbidities. And I think that the key message here is that usually they die more from bleeding events than from cardioembolic events. Now, this is um, uh, a quite recent uh, a paper showing uh, the uh, clinical impact of uh, resuming oral anticoagulation after intracranial hemorrhage, either uh, spontaneous or post-head uh, trauma. And you can see that, uh, in average, the rate of death is 20%, which is very, very high. But you can see that uh, when the uh, oral anticoagulation is uh, reinitiated after you know uh, the healing of the intracranial hemorrhage, then uh, you have a much better outcome than uh, 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 um, no resuming of the therapy. Uh, you have uh, less uh, recurrent stroke, of course, and you have less mortality as compared to uh, um, discharging the patient without uh, any therapy. Uh, when the oral anticoagulation is indicated. And this is not the uh, only uh, registry that we have, and I think that the, the, the data are quite consistent because you can see that it's almost 2,400 uh, patients, uh, which is, uh, I think, meaningful. And then you have uh, a meta-analysis on uh, uh, various studies uh, with uh, almost 5,000 patients uh, with uh, intracranial hemorrhage, mostly on... Uh, vitamin K antagonist therapy. And you can see uh, on uh, the left-hand side that uh, when uh, the treatment uh, is not uh, resumed, uh, then uh, you have uh, more uh, acute thrombotic events, and this is highly significant. Uh, you can see that the uh, uh, ratio is almost 0.34, which means that you have a 70% risk reduction of acute thrombolytic events when you resume therapy 
as compared to uh, discharging your patients uh, without oral anticoagulation. And on the right uh, hand side, you can see that the association between resumption of the uh, oral anticoagulation treatment and intracranial hemorrhage. And the main fear for not to resume therapy is the recurrent intracranial hemorrhage. And you can see that um, there is uh, no uh, further risk. Uh, so the message here is uh, that uh, when the intracranial hemorrhage has healed, and usually these patients are followed with brain MRI, and there is no microbleeds, then you, it, it is safer to uh, resume therapy than, uh, than not. Now we have uh, <coughs> these uh, data showing the trends uh, over you know, the last 15 years uh, uh, in this, the specific setting of uh, resuming oral anticoagulation therapy after injury, and this could be uh, traumatic brain injury, hip fracture, or trauma, tra abdominal injury, or whatsoever. And you can see that um, uh, the, uh, the rate of non-resorption is decreasing and the rate of use of VKA is decreasing, and this is explained because uh, of the uh, much safer profile of uh, direct oral anticoagulation, uh, which are usually, uh, you know, uh, more uh, in, uh, reinitiated uh, in this uh, specific sit situation than VKA therapy. And I think that uh, these are uh, in important data and, and quite recent data. And we have uh, some also, uh, important findings uh, showing the impact of uh, oral anticoagulation after traumatic injury uh, on uh, you know, survival of the patient. And clearly, when the treatment is not resumed, uh, then uh, you have uh, you know, um, a, a less survival as compared to uh, resumption of the treatment. And this is the uh, left-hand side of the treatment. And on the right hand side, you can see the, the risk of uh, ischemic stroke after traumatic injury. And you can see that uh, it is higher uh, when the treatment are not uh, resumed versus uh, uh, re, uh, uh, re resumption of the treatment. So I think that, uh, again, uh, these are very strong data uh, uh, in favor of uh, reinitiating the treatment uh, after a traumatic injury. This is uh, the risk of uh, recurrent bleeds in the same population on, on the left hand side and the risk of recurrent traumatic injury after traumatic injury. And you can see that uh, it is quite safe uh, to uh, resume the therapy uh, in this specific context of uh, uh, from trauma, which can be brain trauma or whatsoever. So I think that uh, the key message here is uh, clear cut and you, you can see that we have uh, uh, seen different settings and we have always uh, the same uh, and consistent message that uh, when there is no uh, uh, clear contraindication for resuming therapy which are mainly uh, brain mic microbleeds then uh, you should uh, resume the uh, oral anticoagulation treatment. Now with respect to uh, antithrombotic uh, association it is of course uh, more complex uh, I cannot uh, go uh, through uh, all the types of uh, situation, but we know that uh, these patients are uh, particularly at risk of bleeds. And nowadays, uh, when you look at the uh, guidelines, uh, there have been uh, big changes uh, towards the use of antithrombotic uh, in these patients. And uh, the, the main idea here is that uh, if you downgrade the treatment intensity, uh, then uh, you have a better outcome of this patient. And I think that uh, it is uh, shown here on this ACC AHA uh, update on the use of triple antithrombotic uh, therapy in the setting of PCI. And uh, if you pay attention to uh, the right hand side, in the patient at low ischemic thrombotic risk and at high bleeding risk, they recommend uh, only uh, triple therapy during the hospital stay and then uh, stopping one of the uh, antiplatelet agents, and even up to six months, stopping all the type of uh, antiplatelet agents, leaving only the oral anticoagulation on board. So there have been big changes because we have learned uh, that in these patients, uh, they bleed more, 
then they have thrombotic events. And usually when they bleed, you stop the treatment and at the end they have recurrent thrombotic events. So it's like a vicious uh, circle. So if you um, <coughs> are interested, you have uh, many uh, practical uh, um, recommendation on how to deal uh, with uh, bleeds uh, in these patients who are on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy with and without oral anticoagulation. And this is the uh, 2017 update uh, of the European Society of Cardiology. And uh, here you can see uh, how you should uh, deal with the moderate bleeds uh, in terms of on the, on, on the left hand side dual antiplatelet therapy, in the middle oral anticoagulation, and on the right in the green the general measures. But you can see that uh, in, in, uh, in uh, these patients with moderate bleeds, which means any bleeds associated with a significant blood loss requ with requiring hospitalization and blood transfusion, usually you have to stop the APT, but you have to continue one antiplatelet agents. With respect to oral anticoagulation, uh, usually you have to withhold the treatment and then you will reinitiate uh, when the Chats vasque is four or more and once the patient has stabilized. And then you escalate uh, according to the situation. So this is the moderate situation, this is the severe situation, and you have the DAP management on the left, you have the uh, oral anticoagulation management in the middle, and then you have the general uh, recommendation. So uh, the worst is the situation and uh, the, uh, usually you, you, uh, you withhold uh, all the treatment and uh, you wait for a few days that the patient has stabilized, but more importantly, the most important factor is to identify the location of the bleeds, and the second uh, key point is to know whether it has been treated effectively, and these are the major determinants of uh, how you should behave uh, with uh, respect to uh, resuming the, the treatment. And finally, you have the life-threatening bleeds. Of course, in this situation, you stop all the treatments uh, because uh, the uh, risk is related only to the bleeds and not to the potential uh, thrombotic events uh, which may occur. So this is the, the final slide, and it shows um, uh, a consensus definition uh, of uh, recurrent bleeding risk categories. And uh, it also uh, shows you uh, how to resume the therapy uh, according to the situation. So if you are in the low risk category for recurrent bleeds, uh, which means that uh, both the bleeding uh, source and severity and the clinical setting and the patient risk factors must be low, these are in the green situation, you can resume the therapy. If you are in the red situation, it means you have an intracranial bleed uh, or life-threatening bleed uh, with unknown location and untreated, so you should not resume the therapy. But you can see that uh, in probably, I would say, 95% of the situation, this uh, table uh, will answer your question. And in the vast majority of the case, uh, you should be able to restart the treatment with a certain amount uh, of time, uh, depending uh, on the situation and on whether the patient has stabilized or not. So to conclude, I would say that uh, has a, a key message. Uh, withholding oral anticoagulation is not beneficial uh, to patient, especially uh, atrial fibrillation patients. And uh, roughly 15% of these patients do not resume uh, their treatment, and they have, of course, a uh, worse outcome, and usually they have a higher uh, rate uh, of mortality. But you have to keep in mind also that uh, when you resume the therapy, uh, you have, of course, a higher risk of uh, recurrent events, but that does not exceed uh, you know, the risk of uh, mortality uh, that is related to not resuming the therapy. Probably the most tricky situation is spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, and uh, for this specific situation, uh, of course, uh, you need uh, uh, a dedication, uh, a dedicated uh, 
staff uh, discussion, uh, especially with uh, the uh, um, specialists from, uh, you know, nor neurovascular uh, uh, subspecialty. And finally, uh, of course, you have to consider the patient comorbidities, and probably you have also to think of switching from VKA to NOAC uh, when you have uh, severe bleeds, especially when it is spontaneous and when it occurs uh, in the brain. So I think I will uh, stop there, but uh, I think that if you, uh, if you go to the references that have been shown uh, in this presentation, uh, you will find nearly all the answers to your question. And I think that uh, the, the most, uh, I would say, unmet needs nowadays are two. First, whether we should use antidote and when the, whether they are beneficial. And we have very few data. Nobody knows. As doctors, we think that uh, it is safer to have antidotes. But to be honest, uh, we have no strong data uh, showing uh, any kind of clinical benefit as compared to having no antidotes in the patients. And finally, uh, the other key points is uh, to uh, be active and proactive uh, in the randomized studies uh, which are looking at resuming versus no resuming of the therapy uh, in, the setting, in the setting of uh, major bleeding situation. There are ongoing trials. They are very difficult uh, to conduct because these patients are very few but I think that uh, this is our task uh, to complete uh, these studies. And usually, uh, in my experience, uh, you know, people who are asking questions are usually uh, the less active uh, in the trials. Thank you very much. So if you have any question. No question, so we stop. <laughs> Thank you. I have to continue. Oh, okay. Wow. How long do I have? Okay, so I will continue. Okay, so um, I will uh, I will continue on on the uh, on, on this uh, specific uh, topic, which is uh, uh, antithrombotic treatment after coronary stenting. Uh, we have seen major bleeds. Now uh, we are looking for. Uh, how to treat uh, these uh, patients. So as uh, I told you, there has been two updates which are quite recent, uh, 2018, on the management uh, of uh, this uh, concomitant disease uh, where you, you have to combine uh, oral anticoagulation with uh, the uh, anti-platelet uh, agents. So usually uh, when I do uh, this talk, I ask a few questions. Uh, first, what is the optimal duration of triple therapy in a stented patient? Is it uh, no triple therapy, one month, six months, 12 months? Uh, so we'll try to answer this question. The second question is whether uh, NOAX uh, should be the preferred uh, uh, you know, uh, oral anticoagulants in the specific situation uh, of uh, PCI in AF patients. The third one is drug eluting stent, a good choice uh, in this specific se uh, setting of uh, atrial fibrillation where you need oral anticoagulation? Is it a better choice uh, over a bare metal stent? And finally, uh, after one year, and in the absence uh, of uh, any contraindication uh, to uh, um, um, a treatment, uh, should we stop all the antiplatelet uh, agents? Is it correct or not? So, uh, what is known, uh, I, I will be uh, fast. First, um, when you have this concomitant disease, and especially when you have AF, 
uh, you have a worse outcome. And because it is a, a marker of risk, uh, and the chat VASC uh, integrates you know, all these independent predictors of worse outcomes uh, related to coronary artery disease. You have hypertension, uh, you have uh, heart failure, uh, you have age, etc. And you can see that uh, you have of more ischemic events, more deaths, and of course, more bleeds. Now, this is what you need to solve. Uh, and uh, of course, when you put a stent, uh, the, the, the best option is antiplatelet agents. And we know that it is much better than oral anticoagulation. And this has been uh, established uh, since many years. On the other hand, we also know that uh, these antiplatelet agents uh, are not beneficial as compared to uh, oral anticoagulation to prevent cardioembolic stroke in AF patients. So you have to solve this equation. Uh, and uh, usually what is not considered here is the effect of time. And uh, as you know, uh, time has a different uh, effect when you consider uh, AF and coronary artery disease. And we know that uh, the rate of stroke uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation remain quite stable, although it slightly increases with age and uh, when comorbidities, comorbidities are occurring. Whereas the effect of time uh, on coronary artery disease is much different. And when you have a stent placed or when you have a, an ACS, and then the risk of uh, recurrent uh, acute coronary thrombotic events is much higher, and then it is declining uh, very fast. Uh, and this is why uh, you need to consider uh, uh, the effect of time, but differently in these two settings. And you can see here uh, the risk uh, of uh, uh, recurrent uh, um, major uh, adverse, adverse coronary events uh, in those patients who are on oral anticoagulants and who underwent stent placement uh, or who just had uh, an acute coronary syndrome. And you can see that there is an exponential decrease uh, of the risk uh, of uh, recurrent coronary events. Uh, and we do not have this time effect uh, in stroke patients. We know that we have a higher risk of recurrent stroke at the early beginning, but the decline is not uh, such uh, uh, impressive. Now, this is the effect uh, of uh, bleeding when you accumulate uh, antithrombotic uh, agents. Uh, these are uh, data from Denmark, from the big uh, Danish registry, and uh, these are also quite recent data, and this is why now we try to avoid uh, you know, such uh, aggressive uh, uh, combination. And we have more and more uh, uh, randomized data uh, showing that. And these are the guidelines uh, from the, the non STEMI in 2015. And this was the first time uh, when we consider uh, the setting of these patients uh, who are referred to you for an acute coronary syndrome while being exposed to oral anticoagulation. And you can see that the level of evidence are C which means that they are weak because at that time we have very few evidence. But still, the, the recommendations were very clear-cut. And it was uh, uh, stated that you should not initiate the uh, antiplatelet drugs before having uh, uh, the coronary anatomy status. And this is the, the red light, uh, the level three of evidence. The green light is that when there is an indication for oral, for oral anticoagulation, you have to continue oral anticoagulation. And this is another important message. And finally, it was stated that an early invasive uh, approach uh, was uh, mandatory in this patient because you want to have the coronary status as fast as possible, avoiding the use of you know, unwanted drugs like antiplatelet uh, agents when you have no coronary disease. Now what we have learned, uh, we have learned very much. First, uh, we have learned about the safety of the device we are using, uh, especially the drug addicting stents. And the leaders free is one of the best trial I ever seen uh, in the stents. Because uh, when they decided to perform this trial, all the patients uh, uh, who were, uh, which were targeted uh, were excluded from uh, you know, the uh, uh, trials that were evaluating uh, the uh, efficacy uh, of the stent. So uh, you can see that in the leaders free, uh, you have elderly patients on oral anticoagulation, 
with anemia, with major bleeds, with cancer. Uh, all the one you don't want to have, you know, in stand trial because of the risk of recurrent, recurrent events. And they compared uh, the uh, uh, efficacy of bare metal stent uh, versus uh, drug eluting stents. And this is uh, a randomized double blind, which means that uh, both the investigators and the patients uh, did not know uh, what uh, they were putting and what they were receiving uh, as the patients. And you can see that uh, uh, the results are amazing in favor of drug eluting stent. And at that time, when uh, these results were published, uh, the, the use of bare metal stent was a contraindication in AF patients on oral, oral anticoagulation because uh, our thoughts were that uh, DES uh, were uh, not uh, safe enough to be used as a, a routine uh, devices. And now you can see <coughs> that uh, three years later, uh, in the uh, myocardial Rivas guidelines, it is stated that DS should be used as the first line, uh, you know, device, whatever is the situation. Whether you should have a short DAPT, whether you, you, you need to have oral anticoagulation, etc., etc. So there is no more place for uh, bare metal stent, uh, especially in the uh, setting of uh, atrial fibrillation with oral anticoagulation. And we have also accumulated uh, uh, some uh, interesting data on the safety of triple versus dual uh, antithrombotic treatment uh, in those patients who are undergoing PCI while being exposed on oral anticoagulation. And what is, it, what is it, uh, interesting in, in this meta-analysis is that uh, it almost uh, fits to our uh, uh, patients that we are having in the routine practice. You can see that uh, uh, the mean age was 70 years old. Uh, the vast majority underwent uh, drug eluting stent implantation. 80% uh, were on oral anticoagulation because of atrial fibrillation, and 50% at an ACS. And interestingly, you can see that uh, when they are uh, exposed for a long time period to uh, triple anti antithrombotic treatment, they have a much higher rate of uh, major bleeds, which is almost twice high as compared to uh, double antithrombotic treatment. And this is a very consistent findings. Uh, of course, the design of the trials were very different. Uh, this is a, a rough meta-analysis, but at least uh, it shows uh, that uh, you should not treat for a long time period uh, with triple antithrombotic uh, anti treatment. And you can see uh, on the uh, left hand side that uh, the rate of ischemic events uh, is the same, whatever is the uh, intensity of uh, the treatment. Uh, so this should be uh, reassuring for uh, especially uh, the people who are uh, interventionalists. Now, on the next slide, you can see uh, what is uh, uh, the benefit of uh, dual antithrombotic treatment versus uh, triple antithrombotic treatment. And the, 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 the most benefit is derived from uh, the reduction in uh, TIMI major bleeds, but also of intracranial bleeds. Whether you can see that the, the rest of uh, the events you are looking at are almost uh, the same, especially deaths, myocardial infarction, stent thrombosis, etc. This is a meta-analysis, and of course, uh, it was not done uh, on uh, individual data, so you, you could not have, you know, definitive conclusion, especially to whether the, 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 the patient had a severe coronary anatomy or not, whether the patient has prior stroke or not, etc., etc., and, ve and very few patients had NOACs. Um, so this is why uh, we need, uh, of course, uh, some more in-depth investigation uh, to uh, provide a better guidance for, uh, for um, you know, the physician. And especially, we need to know whether there was some interactions according to uh, important subgroups uh, like, you know, Chad's VASC, the use of DES, uh, the Hasblet score, and probably uh, we may have different results according to these uh, important uh, predefined subgroups. Anyway, uh, what uh, does uh, the guideline say? Uh, it says that aspirin and clopidogrel uh, should be used as a loading dose when you perform PCI or when there is an ACS. And this is a very uh, important uh, guideline. 
The second key message is uh, that uh, when a, a coronary stent uh, is implanted, uh, you may <coughs> reduce the duration of triple therapy down to one month, uh, uh, irrespective of the type of stent, BMS or DES. Uh, so this is important because many physicians believe that because you are using a DES, you need to have a longer uh, triple anti antithrombotic treatment duration. And it is not the case. And finally, uh, you can continue uh, triple therapy uh, up to six months uh, in the patients uh, who are at the highest risk of uh, recurrent coronary events. And mostly, uh, this patient has been uh, um, uh, identified with, uh, you will see, a very uh, handy uh, tables. Finally, uh, to be short, uh, NOACs are preferred over VKA. And this is a 2AA recommendation. And this, this is a new recommendation based on uh, the results of uh, Pioneer and Redual. So the, drug, the, 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 the randomized trial with David Gatron and with Rivaroxaba. So if you need to use VKA, and this may happen, especially when you have uh, mechanical valves, then uh, <coughs> it is uh, recommended to uh, uh, be uh, very e efficient in terms of TTR. And uh, you need to monitor very closely the INR to be in the target range of 2 to 3 to avoid uh, any types of complication. And finally, you can see the last row. It says that a discontinuation of uh, antiplatelet uh, treatment uh, should be done after 12 months. But to be honest, we have very few data to uh, you know, rely on this uh, recommendation. And finally, no ticagrelor, no prasugrel, and this is important. If you are using dabigatron, you should use uh, the highest dose, 150 milligrams, BID. If you are using rivaroxaban, probably uh, you should use the 15 uh, milligrams uh, dose regimen, although uh, we have very few data. Now, if we think uh, about uh, routine practice, this is you know, the checklist that you should use uh, when you are dealing with triple anti uh, thrombotic treatment. So you have to use the Hasblad and the TADVASC to assess you know, the risk benefit and how you are going to treat your patients. You should keep triple therapy as short as possible based on uh, the data uh, you have seen. If uh, you uh, have the option of using a NOAC, use a NOAC. It has a much better safety profile. The clopidogrel should be the P2Y12 inhibitors of choice. It is now uh, available everywhere. It is quite cheap. Use the PPIs, irrespective of uh, the GI bleeding risk. Use the low-dose uh, aspirin, and of course, if you use uh, VKA, uh, you have to uh, be uh, uh, very efficient in terms of uh, INR monitoring. Now you have to uh, recognize also the high coronary risk features, and this is mainly uh, derived from the DAPT trials, where it was shown that if you continue DAPT, you know, more than one year, beyond one year, uh, you have some... Uh, patients uh, in whom the benefit is higher than others. And uh, they are, of course, uh, listed here. Uh, these are the patients uh, with prior stent thrombosis, the patient with only one patent coronary artery, the one with diabetes and diffuse multivessel disease, and finally, the number of stents that were used. And uh, again, it is very important to identify these features, and this is why when uh, you are uh, writing down uh, your case report form, you have to be precise, concise but precise, so that the GP or the general cardiologist uh, knows uh, what is uh, the patient's coronary status, because this will guide you know, the therapy 
uh, especially uh, during the long-term follow-up. And finally, uh, there are patients in whom you should not fight too much uh, and uh, in whom you should not be too aggressive uh, because uh, they bleed more than the others. And usually, uh, once uh, the bleeds uh, has happened, all the treatment are stopped and they finally died of uh, acute uh, thrombosis, whatever it can be stroke or MIs. And uh, we uh, know very well uh, these patients uh, with ongoing cancer, poor expected adherence, poor mental status, end stage renal failure. So it means that um, you should treat them, of course, but uh, don't be too aggressive. Otherwise, you're going to lose all the benefits of the treatment uh, that you are using. These are uh, the European guidelines uh, <coughs> which summarize into one uh, table uh, how you should, uh, you know, uh, treat these patients. Uh, and it is very interesting because uh, with the same data, uh, the uh, uh, ACC AHA uh, end up with a bit different guidelines, which are probably more practical. But uh, you, you can download these guidelines from uh, the uh, ESC website. But uh, globally, what is uh, recommended is that uh, uh, the, the default strategy should be one month triple therapy. And if the bleeding risk is high, you stop one antiplatelet agents. And uh, if uh, uh, the patient is at very high uh, bleeding risk, uh, you may discharge the patients without a dual antiplatelet therapy, only one uh, antiplatelet agents. But this is not the default strategy. And after one year, you can see that uh, oral anticoagulation alone is recommended. But uh, you should not have uh, high ischemic risk features, uh, as uh, I have shown you uh, on the table. And this is uh, the uh, uh, ACCHA uh, perspective, which is more practical to me. Uh, there is the default strategy. These are, you know, the big boxes. And it says that triple therapy should be used during the hospital stay. And then the patients should be discharged on dual therapy because, because they do think that we have enough evidence uh, for recommending dual therapy as a default strategy. And then you have two sm smaller boxes according to uh, the, the patient's uh, risk profile. In the middle, you have the high ischemic risk with uh, low bleeding risk. And in this patient, you can use triple therapy uh, up to one month and then you have to uh, downgrade. Uh, um, uh, and then you downgrade to double therapy. And on the uh, right-hand side, you have the patient at low ischemic thrombotic risk and high bleeding risk. And in this patient, it is very interesting because they are discharged on dual therapy. So it means one anticoagulants, one antiplatelet agents, and you may stop all the antiplatelet therapy before one year. You may stop all the antiplatelet agents at six months. If you have, for example, a simple lesion of uh, the uh, right coronary artery in a stable patient with a very high uh, chads vask, a very low bleeding risk, then uh, you, you, uh, you, uh, you, you may continue. But on the other side, if you have a very simple coronary artery lesion with a very high bleeding risk patient prior, you know, intracranial hemorrhage, then you may stop all the antiplatelet agents very early. So it's more practical. And you have even a more a simple scheme uh, showing that uh, when there is a, a, a high coronary risk, you, you may add aspirin uh, for one month. And when there is no uh, high coronary risk, you do not add aspirin and you discharge the patient on oral anticoagulation and clopidogrel. And uh, I think that uh, this is a, a good way of thinking because, because uh, you should uh, remind that uh, once the patient is exposed to oral anticoagulation, he is at high risk of bleeds, whatever are the other, uh, you know, associated factors of bleeds. We should not forget that. You remember the first slide of my first talk. It is the first uh, reason for uh, side effect hospitalization. Uh, so these patients, when they are exposed to oral anticoagulation, are at high risk of bleeds. 
and I think that uh, the, the concerns in terms of uh, bleeds should, should always prevail in this specific situation when the patients are exposed to oral anticoagulation. And then you have only to assess the risk of uh, uh, ischemic events. And it is much more simple uh, to uh, practically guide your therapy. Now this is the Augustus trial. I'm just showing uh, this slide because uh, this is a, a recent trial, it's a big trial, and it is the only trial uh, where um, the use of aspirin was randomized also. In all the other trials, uh, the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy on top of oral anticoagulation was left at the discretion of the physician, whereas here there was a double randomization, and this is the, 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 the beauty of this trial. And the primary endpoint, of course, uh, was the safety. And uh, I think that um, most of you have seen uh, this uh, trial, which was released at the last ACC meeting. But you can see that there is a clear-cut uh, benefit of uh, NOAX uh, versus VKA. And this is the first key message. And the second key message is that uh, the safety is much better when you stop aspirin early as versus when you continue uh, aspirin for a long time period. And this is uh, uh, the, the diagram uh, when you split, uh, you know, uh, all the patient categories according to uh, the double randomization. And you can see that uh, the, the much uh, safer approach is to use uh, apixaban with clopidogrel for one month and then stop aspirin. This is the uh, <coughs> Death and rehospitalization, the rate of death was the same, and rehospitalization was higher in uh, patients with uh, VKA. And these are the main ischemic outcomes. And you can see that there is no much concern between apixaban and VKA, and that there is less stroke uh, when you have VKA, uh, when you have uh, apixaban versus VKA, and less uh, rehospitalization, whereas, you know. Uh, the remaining um, events like uh, myocardial infarction or stent thrombosis are nearly the same in both groups. And now these are the same events according to uh, um, uh, the randomization for uh, aspirin or placebo after one month. And you can see that there is a trend uh, for more ischemic and coronary events uh, when the aspirin is stopped early. Uh, but these events are very small uh, numerically, uh, very few events, but still you can see that you have uh, uh, more myocardial infarction and you have more uh, definite or probable stent thrombosis uh, when uh, aspirin is uh, uh, withheld early. So this should guide you uh, in the routine practice, uh, which means that when you have a, a high coronary risk uh, of uh, recurrent events, then you may continue aspirin longer than one month but uh, this is not all the patients. This is only a subset of patients. So uh, you, 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 you will have, uh, of course, the ESC uh, pocket guidelines. Uh, you can uh, uh, download uh, all this uh, table. And if we go back to the quiz and uh, we look at the uh, expected answers, of course, uh, the expected answer for the duration of uh, triple therapy were no triple therapy or one month. This is the default strategy. But of course, at some point, you give triple therapy at the time of PCI or at the time of ACS. So this question uh, uh, starts when the patient is discharged, not before. And you have to use uh, um, triple therapy at the time of the stent implantation. Uh, no acts are preferred. This was correct. And I think that uh, uh, the uh, uh, recent Augustus uh, trial emphasized uh, this uh, uh, finding. And finally, after one year, uh, and in the absence of contraindication, cessation of all antiplatelet agent is encouraged. This is correct. Uh, but again, uh, this may depend uh, on uh, the patients uh, you are dealing uh, with. So I think that uh, if we uh, merge all the data we have uh, into uh, a simple key message, uh, you have to uh, remember that uh, if you use NOAC, versus VKA, uh, you reduce the risk of bleeds uh, by almost uh, 50%. Then if you use uh, dual therapy versus triple therapy, uh, you reduce the risk of bleeds by 50%. And this is the key message 
uh, of uh, this uh, lecture. And then uh, you have to identify the patient at the highest risk of uh, recurrent coronary events according to uh, the prior history and the coronary status. But remember, when you have anticoagulation on board, the patient is at high bleeding risk. Thank you very much. If you have questions, Скажите, пожалуйста, не кажется ли вам, что после прекращения лечения, после появившегося кровотечения, это возобновление более ответственный момент, чем даже первоначальное принятие решения для лечения? И когда мы принимаем решение о возобновлении и лечении, не нужно ли это решать в большей степени через информированное согласие с родителями или, или то есть с детьми, и там, с, и с самим пациентом, чем через свое волевое решение какой-то э, врача? Потому что если будет повторное кровотечение от нашего решения, это более неприятный момент для врача. Спасибо. Yeah, this is a, um, a very good question. Of course, uh, uh, the, 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 the patient needs to be informed and uh, you need to have, uh, uh, his, uh, he needs to consent uh, for this decision. But uh, he should be informed that uh, we have also strong data showing that uh, if we can resume therapy and if the therapy is not resumed, uh, then the mortality is, uh, is higher. And there are uh, only few situations when the, the therapy cannot be resumed and uh, we, uh, we, we, we know them, uh, and we need to identify this situation, and they are mainly uh, uh, intracranial microbleeds. Uh, this, uh, of course, uh, exists, and we, we, we do have to deal with this kind of patients, but in the vast majority of the case, I think that uh, the, the main message is that we can resume therapy, even if there has been an intracranial hemorrhage, uh, especially when it is provoked, uh, we have uh, strong evidence that uh, resuming therapy is associated with uh, um, less uh, mortality, less stroke, and uh, no more uh, recurrent uh, intracranial bleeds. So it, it clearly depends on, on the situation. Здравствуйте. На ваш взгляд, как следует поступать с пациентами, у которых имеется острое повреждение почек, или и с пациентами, у которых хроническая болезнь почек в конечной стадии, пятой? Спасибо. Well, in the, in the specific situation of uh, end-stage uh, renal failure, of course, uh, we need to treat these patients. Uh, but the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the data that we have uh, is that in this specific setting, uh, they do have more bleeds uh, than ischemic events. Uh, so uh, the uh, prevailing strategy is not to be too aggressive. Uh, so it means that um, if you can avoid uh, using a, a long-term uh, triple therapy, you should do it. And I think that the message is that you should identify this patient at even higher bleeding risk. But of course, uh, they should be exposed to oral anticoagulation. They should be exposed to uh, 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 antiplatelet agents. But the, the less uh, uh, aggressive uh, regimen uh, should be used uh, in this particular setting. We are done? No? Okay.
Добрый вечер, спасибо большое за прекрасный доклад. У меня два вопроса, если можно. Первый. У пациента, допустим, непереносимость нестероидных противовоспалительных препаратов, в частности аспирина, и резистентность к лапидогрелю. Что бы мы могли порекомендовать к назначению к пероральным антикоагулянтам? И второй вопрос. Нередко причинами тромбоболических осложнений является наличие длительно восстановленных кардиостимуляторов либо порт систем. Является ли обязательным назначение новых пероральных антикоагулянтов и каким бы отдали предпочтение? Ревексабану, апексабану, либо добиготрану. Спасибо. So the, the, the first question is, um, so you, you have a patient with uh, aspirin intolerance and clopidogrel resistance. This may uh, exist. Uh, this is quite rare. Uh, ben, but when you, 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 you deal with this kind of patient, you, you may use uh, other P2Y12 inhibitors like ticagrel or, or uh, prasugrel. Uh, and uh, for example, in the, in the redual trial, In the Pioneer trial and in the Augustus trial, 6% of the patients were on, um, uh, on Ticagrelo. Um, so uh, it means that you can use them if the bleeding risk is low and if there is no other possibilities. Um, but uh, it is not recommended as a routine approach. Now for the second question, uh, I understand that um, what is the best NOACs? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. <laughs> you should use the one uh, you are uh, comfortable with. Uh, this is uh, probably the, the best answer. Uh, if you look at the AF trial, uh, probably uh, uh, it looks like the, um, uh, the Apixaban uh, was uh, probably the, uh, uh, one of the safest uh, and the one uh, which has some kind of mortality benefit. But So far, this is the only thing I can tell. Now, uh, I think that the third question was uh, uh, with respect to uh, devices, uh, bioprosthetic valves or uh, uh, ICD. Uh, I think that uh, NOACs now are currently used, uh, but to be honest, uh, I don't know if we have enough data to support that. Uh, we have uh, valve thrombosis on, uh, on NOACs, probably they are less frequent than uh, with antiplatelet uh, therapy, especially for, 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 the, for the TAVI. Uh, but uh, we need uh, to have more data to, to, uh, you know, to, to be able to provide a, a, a definitive answer to this question. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Большое спасибо, коллеги. Мы выбились из регламента. Поблагодарим, пожалуйста, профессора Кале. Я понимаю, что вопрос антикоагулянтной терапии дезагрегантно очень актуален. И я попрошу Татьяну Владимировну Вавилову подвести итоги и суммировать. Добрый день, вечер, уважаемые коллеги. Ну, несмотря на некоторые изменения в программе, я поняла и по временным рамкам, и по тематическим, я все-таки... Буду придерживаться того, что заявлено в первоначальной программе. И речь пойдет об антикоагулянтной терапии у больных с фибрилляцией предсердий, но с акцентом на российский опыт. Так, это коротко. И постараюсь быть краткой. Итак, если человек не получает антикоагулянтную защиту, антитромботическую защиту, то с высокой долей вероятности он имеет осложнение ишемического характера и кардиомболический инсульт у больных с фибрилляцией предсердий. При анализе того, той ситуации, кто же, у кого случается этот ишемический инсульт, оказывается, что значительная доля, более 80% этих пациентов не получали вовсе рекомендуемую терапию или не получали ее не в том виде, как это должно было быть. Могут быть неудачи и в случае, если все назначено правильно, 
и правильно мониторируется варфарин. Но никто и не обещал стопроцентной защиты от ишемических событий. Эту картинку вы все знаете, и все показания на сегодняшний день прописаны и известны. И мы идем уже с этой картинкой в руках в клиническую практику и наблюдаем за определенными случающимися с пациентами событиями в рамках наблюдательных регистров. Одним из таких регистров является и регистр Глория АФ, который показывает, как распределяются на сегодняшний день прием разных вариантов антитромботической защиты у больных с фибрилляцией предсердий. И российские коллеги, российские ученые также принимали участие, принимают участие в этом регистре Глория АФ. Вы видите здесь некий клинический портрет. Это цитата из названия статьи, опубликованной по данному поводу, с довольно высокой коморбидностью, примерно пополам разделив, разделившейся по полу. Средняя возрастная группа, средний возраст 63 года, но и достаточный разброс. Были ишемические события в анамнезе у значительного количества, более половины сердечной недостаточно. То есть такая достаточно тяжелая картина. И если посмотреть по данным этого регистра, что же получают российские пациенты, включенные вот эти 400 человек, за которыми тщательно наблюдали, то мы видим, что предпочтения отдаются прямым, оральным, прямым ингибиторам факторов свертывания. Есть некая доля 10% на аспирине. Совсем мало людей не получают никакой терапии. Может быть, потому что они, хотя это было ретроспективное включение, и они не знали, что будут включены в регистр, но это немножко расходится с теми данными, которые были в Гарфилде в свое время представлены. И порядка 20% все-таки остаются на варфарине. Тем не менее... Распространение новых антикоагулянтов, уже и не новых, а прямых оральных антикоагулянтов, идет очень быстро. И это обосновано теми исследованиями, которые проводились, и которые подтверждают их эффективность и безопасность. Также есть дополнительные аналитические данные, которые из разных уголков России поступают и демонстрируют, что отсутствие терапии или неправильное ее назначение не защищает пациентов, и они находятся в зоне опасности, и именно такие больные получают ишемические события. Но надо сказать, что несмотря на такие успехи и понимание путей антитромботической терапии, антикоагулянтной терапии у больных с фибрилляцией предсердий, у нас есть и нерадостные некие данные, которые указывают из, также из различных субъектов федерации, из разных уголков России о том, что не уменьшается количество кардиоэмборических событий. Здесь представлены данные по Алтайскому краю о тромбозах и эмболиях в периферические, эмболиях в периферические артерии. И в целом общее количество экстренных тромбоэмболоктомий в России с 2014 по 2017 год выросло, как говорится в отчете ведущего сосудистого хирурга Покровского, представленного в 2017 году. Кроме той э, приятной пары мужчина с цветами, женщина, похожая на английскую королеву, которую вы видели, у нас есть и другая э, российская реальность. У нас есть пациенты, у которых э, нет другого дохода, кроме пенсии, Пенсия составляет, это данные по Курской области, составляет э, очень скромную сумму. Э, эти люди не получают э, помощи от э, детей в силу либо своей скромности и нежелания э, обременять кого-то, либо просто отсутствия таких родственных связей. 
И доктор, который их лечит, он знает об их проблеме, он назначает им оральные антикоагулянты. Но что же происходит дальше? Если понаблюдать за этими пациентами, то в течение года только 22% лиц остаются на антикоагулянтной терапии, в первую очередь потому, что это дорого. И в этих условиях, а также учитывая некие клинические группы, которые не могут жить, не могут получать данный вид препаратов и должны оставаться на варфарине, вот эта терапия и организация лечения варфарином, она остается актуальной. В принципе, она остается актуальной в мире и она остается актуальной в России. Еще необходимо сказать также о том, что подчас просто не назначаются в должном объеме, в должной, в, по должным показаниям антивитамин К препараты именно из-за плохой организации мониторинга этой непростой группы лекарственных средств. Для решения этих вопросов многие регионы России идут примерно в одном направлении, немножко избирая разные формы, и создают систему либо централизованного мониторинга, либо систему кабинетов контроля антикоагулянтной терапии. Такая система была создана в Санкт-Петербурге, она функционирует в рамках государственных гарантий то есть обязательного медицинского страхования, вы видите галочками отметены, отмечены те, те места, где находятся такие кабинеты в нашем городе, хотя конфигурация города очень непростая, чисто территориально, и поддерживать везде одинаковую доступность бывает очень непросто. Своим путем пошла Курская область. В Курске создана система централизованного мониторинга международного нормализованного отношения, по сути, не этого лабораторного показателя, а по сути тех больных, которые получают антикоагулянтную терапию в арфарин в первую очередь. И система эта функционирует уже с 2012 года. И за это время увеличилось время нахождения в терапевтическом интервале пациентов с 30%, что очень характерно для России. Это средняя российская обычная цифра 30% ТТР до 70%. Более 3000 пациентов сейчас находятся под зонтиком этой системы. И вы видите, что те лица, которые находятся вне системы такого централизованного мониторинга, они получают ишемические эпизоды значительно чаще. Если сравнить два субъекта федерации, рядом лежащих Курскую область и Белгородскую область, то э, санавиация летает на тромбоэмболоктомии в Курской области значительно реже, э, и не потому что нет такой возможности, а потому что нечего, э, не из чего делать эмболоктомию по сравнению с соседней Белгородской областью, где организационные проблемы мониторинга пока еще не решены. Но если все-таки не варфарин, а если мы все-таки можем и должны стараться назначать новую группу препаратов, то перед нами стоит целый ряд вопросов, и выбор идет совместно врачом и лечащим доктором и пациентом. И учитываться должны и данные рандомизированных исследований, и данные реальной клинической практики, то, с каким пациентом мы имеем дело, и какова фармакокинетика и фармакодинамика принимаемых препаратов, что говорят клинические рекомендации, и, конечно, что предпочитает сам пациент. Вот эти э, картинки всем хорошо известны. Я не буду на, останавливаться на том, что э, прямые ингибиторы факторов свертывания – это хорошо, это не хуже варфарина, а по многим позициям, особенно безопасности по интеркраниальным кровоизлияниям, э, даже лучше. Но нужно понимать, что э, люди, которые э, страдают фибрилляцией предсердий и э, нуждаются в такой защите, в основном это пожилые люди. Более того, население земного шара стареет, и даже не всматриваясь в мелкие цифры, ну нет, они не такие уж тут мелкие, 
но видно даже по цветовой гамме, как к 2050 году более темными становятся поля на всех континентах, прибывает количество пожилых людей, увеличивается продолжительность жизни, и мы будем сталкиваться все больше и больше с проблемами необходимости антитромботической терапии. У пожилых пациентов мы должны учитывать несколько факторов. У них риски инсультов и кровотечений пересекаются. Есть, есть группа хрупких пациентов, которые особенно беззащитны в силу своих, своего биологического состояния. Пациенты с низкой приверженностью по разным, и по ментальным причинам, и по тем экономическим причинам, о которых я говорила. Много сопутствующих заболеваний, с существенным образом ограничивают нас состояние почечной функции, прогрессирующий атеросклероз. И на этом фоне мы стараемся не навредить больному, а стараясь не навредить, получается, что мы... Мы хотим снизить дозу, то есть дать пациенту минимально эффективную дозу для того, чтобы сделать то, что мы должны сделать, но все-таки не получить кровотечение. Надо сказать, что во всех трех исследованиях, тех трех препаратов, которые у нас на рынке есть, пожилые занимали значительную долю лица старше 75 лет. Наибольшая доля была в Rocket AF исследовании, и в этом исследовании была показана эффективность и безопасность, достаточная безопасность препарата при сопоставлении групп. Были сделаны выводы о том, что по сравнению с более молодыми отличается более высокая частота встречаемости инсульта и системной эмболии в анамнезе, более высокий риск тяжелого кровотечения, идентичный риск геморрагического инсульта. Но профиль эффективности и безопасности в целом, если бы рассматривать, на, не зависел от возраста пациента для ревороксабана. Хотя, повторяю, мы, конечно, акцентируем внимание на тех особенностях пожилого возраста, которые, которые должны учитывать. Если посмотреть на другую составляющую, вот эта сниженная доза, как она себя, как, кого было распределение сниженной дозы, в, которую нам так хочется назначить пациенту в рандомизированных контролируемых исследованиях. В этом отношении Добиготран находится, наверное, в таком преимущественном положении, потому что там была рандомизация. Там сразу делили пациентов, тебе 150, тебе 110, 150, 110, и затем сравнивали результаты, полученные при наблюдении за этими больными. Что касается анти-10А препаратов, ревороксабана и апексабана, то здесь ориентировались на другие критерии, в первую очередь на состояние почечной функции. И вы видите, что у апексабана доля, вот этот сектор очень маленький, доля пациентов, получающих 2, получавших 2,5 мг два раза, была небольшой. Это третья фаза исследований. Реальная клиническая практика, в реальности, что получается на сегодняшний день. Почти поддерживает свои 50-процентное распределение Добигатран, увеличил количество лиц, получающих меньшую дозу Ривароксабан, и значительно увеличено количество лиц, получающих сниженную дозу для Пексабана. Вот это наше желание защитить пациента, не навредить ему, сыграло с препаратами, в первую очередь с апексабаном, злую шутку. Что получилось? Получилось, что, если, что при анализе довольно большой базы 15 тысяч пациентов, получавших стандартную или сниженную дозу препарата, можно было среди больных выделить группу со сниженной функцией почек, которые действительно нуждались в сниженной дозе. То есть они, у них были почечные показания к снижению дозы, но доза не снижалась. 
И в условно, в кавычках, это можно назвать передозировкой. Совершенно логично, эти люди, которые получили большую дозу, чем могут пережить или вывести их почки, они дали большее количество кровотечений. И здесь три препарата не разделялись, потому что в целом количество таких больных было небольшое. А вот когда стали анализировать те, тех пациентов, которых, у которых показаний к снижению по функции почек или <coughs> для апексабана не было показаний, но из э, сострадания к пациенту, условно так можно сказать, э, маленькой э, такой вот э, пожилой женщине давали 2,5 мг, два раза снижали дозу, то получили эффект обратный. Больные были недолечены, не защищены, и в несколько раз увеличилось количество ишемических событий у лиц получавших апексабан. В меньшей, в меньшей степени пострадали <coughs> добигатран и ревароксабан. Необоснованное снижение дозы апексабана в реальной клинической практике почти в пять раз увеличивало риск инсульта. То есть мы не защищали, мы вроде бы что-то делали, вроде и совесть наша спокойна, а на самом деле мы не помогали пациенту преодолеть вот эти опасности, эти риски. Тенденция назначения низких доз прямых ингибиторов факторов свертывания характерна не только для России. Это происходит во всем мире. Вы видите, здесь представлены данные. Количество лиц со сниженной дозой ревароксабана одинаково в России и в других странах, но на 10% больше, чем в исследовании Рокет. Для добигатрана Ничего не происходило, как их было 50, так примерно 50. Видите, Россия чуть-чуть выбилась. А вот Апексабан, конечно, здесь представлен в очень такой, оказался в очень невыгодной ситуации. И таким образом мы понимаем, что следует избегать оф-лейбл снижения дозы прямых ингибиторов при отсутствии соответствующих показаний. В целом, заключая уже свое выступление, я хочу сказать, что мнение экспертов следующее на сегодняшний день. На основании имеющихся клинических данных невозможно рекомендовать какой-либо один из прямых ингибиторов фактора свертывания в качестве препарата выбора у пожилых пациентов с фибрилляцией предсердий. Наверное, не, то, не только у пожилых, наверное, это можно и распространить на всю когорту пациентов с фибрилляцией. И рекомендуется индивидуальный подход с учетом риска кровотечения, коморбидности, других факторов, связанных с пациентом. И э, профессор Коллит очень э, доступно, очень наглядно показал, как сегодня представлено это в клинических рекомендациях. Благодарю вас за внимание. Вопросы? Да. Спасибо большое за интересный доклад по очень актуальной в настоящее время теме для практикующих докторов. Скажите, пожалуйста, свое мнение в плане профилактики антикоагулянтной у пациентов, перенесших коронарное шунтирование, у которых развивается фибрилляция предсердия после операционном периоде. Можем ли мы руководствоваться теми рекомендациями по двойной и тройной терапии у пациентов после ЧКВ? И в частности, если у пациента до коронарного шунтирования не было в анамнезе ЧКВ, был либо просто ОКС без подъема СТ, без тентирования, или стабильное ИБС, и к какому антикоагулянту следует отдать предпочтение? Вы имеете в виду ситуацию, когда до операции не было фибрилляции предсердия? Да. Она развелась в раннем послеоперационном периоде, да. имела форму пароксизма и дальше не повторилась. Повторялась рецидивирующая течение. Да. Тогда мы идем по стандартной схеме. Мы идем по стандартной схеме, положенной для пациентов с э, нуждающихся в антикоагулянтах, была представлена схема нуждающихся в антикоагулянтной терапии и э, перенесших 
вмешательства на коронарных артериях. Если этот эпизод фибрилляции очень кратковременный и происходит в раннем послеоперационном периоде и в большей степени носит такой дисметаболический характер на фоне искусственного кровообращения или каких-то трансфузионных вот перепадов, тогда вопрос тоже решается индивидуально. Но если это совсем первые часы в ранние, то мы можем не рассматривать этого пациента как пациента, нуждающегося в антикоагулянтной защите. А если у пациента не было ЧКВ, то есть не было стентирования, следует отдать предпочтение комбинации с аспирином или с копидогрелом нового орального антикоагулянта? А, а, оперировали, что аортокоронарное шунтирование было выполнено? Да, коронарное шунтирование. А, аортокоронарное шунтирование и э, затем фибрилляция показания к антикоагулянтам. Да. Есть. Вы знаете, здесь четко не прописано, какова, каков выбор. Если пациент переживал в, в ранее инфаркт миокарда до стентирования, да, это не была просто стабильная ишемическая болезнь, которая привела его на операционный стол, а у него были какие-то ишемические события, мы можем рассуждать о клопидогреле, о клопидогреле в большей степени, чем об аспирине. И НОАК именно в такой же дозировке, вот в полной дозировке, если позволяет. НОАК, СКФ, НОАК, да, НОАК в полной дозировке, у него фибрилляция. Комбинация, то есть НОАК и да, клопидогрел да, предпочтительнее, да. Мы можем нежели здесь, НОАК с аспирином. Получается. Здесь мы не можем идти на сниженную дозу. Спасибо. Скажите, пожалуйста, если вы в зависимости от вашего ответа, может следовать еще второй вопрос. Тогда я отвечу как надо. У меня вебинар в 8. Первый вопрос. Мы видим, что выбор дозы антикоагулянта зависит в большей степени от скорости клубочковой фильтрации. А иной раз даже вообще не назначение их. Скажите, пожалуйста, сколько раз надо определять скорость клубочковой фильтрации, чтобы решить такой ответственный вопрос, ответить на него? Сколько раз надо определять скорость клубочковой фильтрации? Скорость клубочковой фильтрации достаточно определить однократно. Однократно. Вот теперь возник мой второй вопрос. Так, давайте. Вот смотрите, пожалуйста, вот, э, скорость клубочковой фильтрации будет зависеть от частоты сердечных сокращений, от артериального давления, от фракции выброса, а при фибрилляции предсердий, в зависимости от того, какой период вы берете кровь на скорость клубочковой фильтрации, креатинин там, да, от этого будет зависеть от этих факторов. Не кажется ли вам, что мы, если возьмем кровь на креатинин, когда низкое давление, когда частота сердечных сокращений большая, когда фракция выброса низкая, мы можем получить содержание креатинина больше. И от этого будет зависеть, как мы определяем дальше по формуле, скорость клубочковой фильтрации. Мы не можем промахнуться, ошибиться, и много наших пациентов недополучат соответствующие дозы антикоагулянту в связи с этим. Спасибо. Вы знаете, вопрос ваш правомочный, но он не столь, ситуация не столь критична, как нам вот может представляться. Значит, во-первых, если есть серьезные нарушения клубочковой фильтрации, и клеренность креатинина снижена значительно, небольшие девиации в, вокруг этого снижения не имеют значения клинического. Нам понятно, что он снижен, и мы сегодня должны назначить дозу сниженную. Или наоборот, это нормальное значение, и мы сегодня должны назначить дозу стандартную. Но дальше все пациенты, которые получают прямые ингибиторы факторов свертывания, нуждаются в регулярном мониторировании почечной функции. И если мы говорим о человеке, у которому, которому поставлен диагноз хроническая болезнь почек, то не 
реже, чем один раз в три месяца, у него должна быть, должна быть проверена эта функция почек, потому что иногда события развиваются по учечной недостаточности очень стремительно. Если у нас на старте есть малейшие сомнения в том, что измерена функция почек, либо измеренная лежит в какой-то серой зоне, вот в пограничной зоне, да, либо измерена недостаточно корректно в силу какого-то состояния пациента. Может быть, иногда у вас есть сомнения в работе лаборатории, хотя это рутинное такое исследование, и там больших ошибок не сделаешь то мы все равно должны назначить по тому факту, который сегодня вы измерили. Мы не должны откладывать период назначения. А дальше мы можем это сделать в следующий раз не через три месяца, а через две недели. И за этот период времени больной, уже начавший получать антикоагулянтную терапию и э, определенный щит, выставившись за это время, с ним ничего не случится. Речь идет, конечно, о э, более долгосрочных, вот, неблагоприятных таких результатах, которые... Еще одна рука. Здравствуйте. Спасибо Здравствуйте. огромное за доклад, за ответы на вопросы. Фибрилляция предсердия – это, несомненно, очень важная тема, особенно в нашей российской глубинке и действительности. Да. И вот как раз-таки организация кабинетов помощи антикоагулятной терапии, она как-то законодательно регламентирована, поскольку я вот в настоящее время вижу, что даже, скажем так, в городах с населением 250, 300, 400 тысяч, даже в столицах наших краев, республик, там областей нету таких кабинетов. А все-таки пациентов таких достаточно много, которым нужно контролировать. И не всегда есть возможность контроля и подбора препарата по МНО. Ну, по МНО. И вот можно ли вот в России как-нибудь это законодательно утвердить, чтобы, допустим, в каждом городе или в определенном населенном пункте с численностью находился такой кабинет? Спасибо. Спасибо вам за э, такой важный вопрос. И, э, можно сказать, вы наступили на больное, такое, <laughs> на больное место российское. У нас нет законодательной базы. И то, что сейчас в регионах происходит, это локальное решение. И зависит это локальное решение от двух э, обстоятельств. От... Э, доброй воли администрации, от здравоох... администраторов от здравоохранения и от, и от энтузиазма э, отдельных лиц, понимающих важность этой проблемы. И только если эти два обстоятельства сходятся вместе, и энтузиазм даже перевешивает, то тогда удается достичь каких-то результатов. И тому пример, примером может быть и Курск, где выделен администрацией департамент по здравоохранению, министерство, не знаю, как у них называется, главный внештатный специалист Курской области по антитромботической терапии. Какой законодательство? Но почему он выделен? Потому что этот человек, Максим Владимирович Хруслов, он жизнь свою положил и кладет вот на создание этой системы э, мониторинга. У нас есть в Архангельске благоприятных, у нас сейчас разв разворачивается Казань. Все благодаря энтузиазму людей, которых, которые этим занимаются. И самое важное еще, что эти кабинеты должны быть в рамках государственных гарантий. Мы частных избушек настроить можем сколько угодно, но люди у нас не могут ходить и не должны ходить. У нас есть Конституция Российской Федерации, где написано, что здравоохранение бесплатное. Если э, больше нет вопросов, спасибо большое за внимание. Э, кто хочет подключиться к вебинару в 20 часов, там будет продолжение этой темы. Формомет.рф. Заходите.